Hey folks, and welcome to Typology, the show in which we explore the mystery of the human personality through the lens of the Enneagram. My name is Anthony Skinner. I'm the producer of the show, and we are thrilled to have you with us today. It's a special day. We have an author, speaker, executive pastor, and dear friend of mine on the show, Jonathan Pitts. He is author of the book, My Winter Season, Seeing God's Faithfulness in the Shadow of Grief. And that's Winter, W-Y-N-T-E-R. Winter is Jonathan's wife of 15 years who sadly and suddenly passed away just over two years ago now. And again, the subtitle is Seeing God's Faithfulness in the Shadow of Grief. And we're going to be talking about grief today through Jonathan's story and through the lens of the Enneagram. Jonathan has a long bio with a list of accolades for amazing girls that he is raising now. I could go on and on about Jonathan, but let's go ahead and get into the interview. This is a rich interview. Stay with us through the whole thing. Share this one with your friends. It's such a powerful story, and you're going to be encouraged with the way that Ian and Jonathan mind this subject of grief. So excited to have you with us today. That's it for me, Anthony Skinner. And now, without any further ado... Here is the host of our show, Ian Cron. Jonathan Pitts, welcome to Typology. Hey, thanks for having me. Excited to be here, I think. (laughs) (laughs) Everybody comes in with that trepidation, man. Right. I've been the most excited and the most nervous about uh, doing this. Well, we're glad you're here and relax, man. We're we're not going to dissect you Mm. uh, in in the course of this time, though we might try. so we're we're in here talking today about grief, uh, a topic we've not spoken about uh, on typology, and we felt like you were a really good get for this topic because mm-hmm. of your story. Mm. And so, if you could just, you know, give us a a few words about what what qualifies you to be in that chair today. Yeah, well, if I'll start by saying I don't know what qualifies me, but I'll share who I am. Um, I am uh, I'm a pastor in Franklin, Tennessee. Um, I uh, I'm a widower, and um, I had a 15-year and 27-day marriage to a wonderful, beautiful woman named Winter Danielle Pitts. And um, about two and a half years ago, um, July 24th, 2018, we were leaving Dallas on our way to Nashville for me to take a new role, and we were excited about this new future together with our four daughters after having had an awesome um, life in Dallas, um, me working in kind of nonprofit ministry world, and uh, my wife, being a published author, she started a magazine for girls called For Girls Like You and published a bunch of um, different books in that, that same space. And we were moving. We had moved, bought our house in Nashville, um, got our girls in school or in Franklin, got our girls in school, um, joined our new church and all the things and went back to Dallas for a week for me to finish, finish up my role. And uh, Winter tragically and really suddenly uh, passed away in my arms as I tried to save her life. And it was the single most traumatic moment of my life. Prayerfully, it remains that, um, and you know, three of my girls were there. Were there? It was traumatic for them. It was traumatic for all of us. Um, but we uh, we continued our move, and we left Dallas, and um, we landed in this amazing little town, and it's been an awesome place for healing for the last couple of years. So that's where I'm at, and um, you know, just recently began writing down the stories of the ways that um, I saw um, my life being. Um, just really just seeing beauty in my life and, and noticing just some really beautiful things. And I'm a Christian and I can't even look at my life without looking through that lens and just seeing the things that God has done to mm-hmm. kind of surround me and protect me and heal me like in a really painful time. So, mm. yeah. Well, thanks for, for the story. And I think it's important for our folks to know, how old are you? I am 40. I'm 40. I turned 40 in March. I'll be 41 pretty soon here. Okay. And uh, today actually is Winter's birthday. Today is her birthday. Yeah, she would have been forty-one today, and um, yeah, it's funny. Like my fam, all of us. This is the third birthday we will have celebrated without her here, mm-hmm. and it's a different year. It's different for all of us. We're all like looking at it differently, and some of us more light, some of us more um, deep, some of us more in pain. And um, yeah, it's just been interesting. Just and and being on here today, it's just really. Just interesting timing. So. And when you say us, you mean? Sorry, uh, my four daughters. I have a 16-year-old, a 14-year-old, and twin 11-year-olds. And then I also have a sister, and then we also have a, a, a little Yorkie poo that mm-hmm. also lamented a little bit today through <laughs> getting in the trash already. So, yeah. Right. Your sister who lives with you. Yeah, my sister, yeah. her name is Carmen. She moved in with me um, about a month after Winter passed away. I, 
I was coming to Franklin and she told me on the day of Winter's funeral, hey, I feel like if, if you need me, I need to come. I'll be there. Mm-hmm. And I was I was just three-ish enough to know or to think that I could make it on my own. Coming into the new town as a pastor with these four daughters, I'm like, I got it. I'm good. Like two weeks later, I burned a chicken and just went upstairs crying as my daughters laughed at me. And uh, I called my sister immediately and I said, is that offer still on the table? Mm. Two weeks later, Memorial Day weekend of 2018, she was on a plane, had um, sold her car, had um, Mm. canceled her lease on her apartment and whittled her way down to like three suitcases and arrived on my doorstep. Um, And she's been amazing for me and for my girls. She also has a master's in counseling, which is hilarious. So she's the perfect person to come into my home. (laughs) She's a two, as you told me earlier. She is a two. She's a two. She's a therapist. She's your sister. Yeah, Yeah, you scored. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Big time. I mean, honestly, there's nobody that could have walked into my life and in my family like she has and just been... um, everything mm. or most things that we've needed. She can't do everything, but she's done a ton. It's been beautiful. Yeah. And you have a veritable bouquet of Enneagram types in, <laughs> in your house, don't you? Why don't you tell folks about that? Yeah, I've got a six, I've got a seven, I've got an eight, and I've got a four. And, um, and then my sister's a two, and I'm a three myself. So, yeah. We're only missing three numbers here, man. Yeah. And my wife was a nine, so I also experienced life with a nine. So. All right, we're, we're missing only two numbers here. <laughs> We got two well, fours in the room, so. Well, we got two fours in the room, right? You have a, you have a, an over, you're overweighted with, with fours, okay? <laughs> and I want to come back to that because part of what we want to talk about today is obviously your journey of grief, and, uh, but and as importantly as a three on the enneagram, but I also want to talk about all the types in grief, right? Sure, yeah. Because each of us digests or metabolizes grief uh, in different ways, and I think it's helpful for people to know. Um, how do I grieve mm-hmm. in the context of my type? How, how do I grieve well and how do I need to be careful yeah. about, about how I grieve? And so maybe we'll be able to integrate some of that conversation into, into your journey, especially with all these different people living with you because you've had a chance to watch firsthand mm-hmm. how different types. Yeah, watch firsthand and fail firsthand at, I think, trying to have my girls live out mm-hmm. my life and how I process and failing early and often in that. So I can share a lot of what, maybe what not to do. <laughs> Great wisdom, mm-hmm. right? I think um, that is true in every household. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. you know, I can tell you that when my, my, my wife lost a brother when he was 14, and the way that her mother grieved was so different from the way that the father grieved. Mm-hmm. She's a not one, he was a, he's a, was a nine. Um, was so different that, and they couldn't understand how they grieved. And it was a source of real dissonance. Yeah, you know, um, mm. and and so it is important for us to recognize how differently people grieve and allow them space. Yeah, to grieve in the way that is um, appropriate to their architecture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I think I just need to say thank you because I found your podcast. I can't even remember how, but I was still married, and probably two years before Winter passed away. I'm guessing, or a year. Um, but I, I started to learn, she was a nine, I started to learn in our relationship some of the things that we just, ways we saw the world differently, and it actually started to really benefit our marriage. And um, so I guess I imported into my grief experience some of what I learned in my marriage experience, just relationally. And again, it would be through a lot of failure that I would recognize, oh, I need to adapt here, I need to change here, I need to have more patience with my daughter here, you know, think differently here. Um, so anyway, it's been a learning process for sure. Yeah. All right, from your perspective, you know, maybe even through the lens of a three, how would you define grief? Yeah, I say that grief is um, dealing with lost expectation. Like you expected one thing, you got something different. So for me, part of my grief was I expected 30 or 40 years with winter, I got 15. Um, You know, and whether it's the death of a loved one or any other loss, a job loss, a marriage gone wrong, whatever the thing might be, I think it's just the process of dealing with your lost expectation and what you feel like you're either owed or needed or had so that's how i describe it Mm. i like too that you just brought up other we tend to associate grief with death Mm -hmm. and certainly grief is the death of a dream or the death of a projected preferred future but i i think that we tend to not appreciate the small griefs in our lives yeah I just even wonder if there's any point in our lives when we are grieving Mm. something, Yeah, you know? Um, It may be a friend moving. It Mm -hmm. could be the loss of a pet, which is one of the most underestimated sources of grief and trauma in people's lives. Um, 
Another one would be uh, a miscarriage Mm -hmm. is another greatly underappreciated source of of Mm. grief. And and so many people just say, oh, don't worry about it. You're going to have another baby or, you know, whatever. And they completely shortchange. Yeah. What a source of grief that is. Yeah, or even having babies. I remember my wife, um, with each baby that she had, she grieved the loss of other things in her life and mm. had really had to deal with that and process that um, mm. and came out on the other side of that, like hopeful with all that she was given, like with our girls. But there was a real process to letting go of what she thought was the loss of her professional career, which came right back around when she started publishing. But um, I remember walking with her through that grief. And that was probably one of the hardest things I walked through in marriage was walking with her through um, really giving her life for our four daughters in the way that she felt like she was supposed to. So. Mm. Hey everybody, one of the lessons I've learned over the years is that not everybody benefits from a traditional 50-minute counseling session. And this is why some people can go to couples therapy or personal counseling for a long time and never really get anywhere. This is why I'm such a believer of intensive counseling and my friends at Restoring the Soul in Colorado, created by my longtime friend Michael Cusick to help couples or individuals experience deep change and have day blocks over one or two weeks. Now listen, if you can't wait months or years to get to the bottom of an issue or to experience breakthrough, you need to get in touch with my friend Michael and his extraordinary team of counselors at Restoring the Soul. If you're looking to get out of the rut you're in but can't wait months or years, call Restoring the Soul today for a free consultation with Michael's staff. Call 303-932-9777 and learn how their intensive counseling process can help you as a special bonus just for typology listeners make sure to visit www.restoringthesoul.com slash typology to download their pdf called five ways unaddressed trauma may be derailing your relationships i'm wondering you know because the threes go to is to begin to set goals expectations and grieving is so much more of a being thing instead of a doing thing and you're hardwired to do what does that look like that transition to move from oh my gosh i actually can't do grief i have to be in the grief yeah it's funny because i haven't known how to be until i turned 38 years old and i lost Mm. winter um Mm. it's funny we 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 remodeled our bedroom like probably six months before leaving dallas not knowing that we were leaving that house and I imported everything from that bedroom when we moved to the new bedroom in our house in Franklin. And above our bed are two words that winter embodied, which are be still, which is Mm. two words from uh, the book of Exodus, be still and know I'm God, but like be still. And winter knew how to be. She knew how to be, how to rest. It's funny. I posted a picture three years ago on her birthday um, on Instagram that shows her napping. We were at a hotel in Santa Monica and we get to the hotel and this is how it always goes. Get to the hotel. I go and work out right away. And then she takes a nap and I walked into the, the bed, into the room and I took a picture of her like sleeping in the bed. And this would have been our, I guess, um, around 13 years of marriage, I guess. And I just, I took a picture and said, I think I'm finally okay with this. Mm. And I learned from her, like what it looked like, what it looks like to rest, what it looks like to work from a place of rest and not from a place of like, I have to, I have to, and mm-hmm. just do. And so now it's funny. I feel like she left me a gift of those words in our bedroom because anytime I get frustrated or I feel like I'm not doing enough, I'm not grieving well. I literally sit down in this chair in my bedroom and I just look at those words and I feel like winter's telling me just be still, Mm. like just relax, just be. So Mm. it's been a hard lesson for me and I'm still learning it. Yeah. You've got all these other numbers in your life. Mm -hmm. Um, What did you learn about grief through their eyes? Yeah. It's funny. Um, my, my six, I think I've learned the most from her and, um, I'm like a pretty trusting guy by nature Mm -hmm. and I assume the best, even like the loss of winter, I'm like looking for optimism and hope and I'm just searching as far and wide as I can to find that. And uh, I found that she was just in this place of like being really distrustful. And I remember one time walking into her bedroom and um, this would have been a couple months in, uh, maybe six, six or eight months in. And um, she's in her bed and I just say, what's wrong, honey? And she's told this story publicly, so I feel like I can tell it, but I say, what's wrong, honey? And she's just like, nothing. She doesn't want to talk. And I'm just like, I'm just trying to be in this place of just being there. I'm her dad. I love her. And I wouldn't leave the room. And I just stayed there. And we just, I kept processing with her and asking her just to talk. And then she finally says to me, she says, dad, I'm having a hard time believing that God is real. And if he Mm -hmm. is, I'm having a hard time believing that he's good. And me as this pastor in Franklin, Tennessee, I take this as this personal indictment of me and the job I'm doing 
and what I'm doing with my girls. And I remember walking into my bedroom and really having to like, just, um, really repent myself or just like, just apologize for like to God for like the way that I was like expecting my daughter to be a 38 year old Enneagram three male, as opposed to the, you know, 14 year old Mm. female she is. And, um, Anyway, I went back in her room and I apologized to her. And that was the beginning of me realizing that I had like a codependent relationship where I thought like everything, when she's happy, I'm happy. When she's sad, I'm sad. And everything she does, says, thinks is a personal indictment on me. And I have to somehow fix that or manipulate that. And um, it was a it was a, a real learning process and a painful process for me um, and for her. And she was very gracious and patient with me as well. And yeah, thankfully mm. we've got an awesome relationship. But that's that that it's it's things like that. Me expecting them to be like me, grieve like me. Um, and what's funny is I remember um, my seven uh, at the funeral. I remember like at Winter's funeral, it was like a thousand people there. It was a beautiful funeral, a hopeful funeral, a celebration. And I remember um, after the family visitation, before they opened the doors for people to come in, um, I knew I wanted to be out there when people came in to thank them for coming. We had people flying in from everywhere, and I wanted to thank them. And so. I remember um, just staying there and all the family went kind of back to the backstage or whatever. And I stayed there and I just started greeting people as they came down to kind of have a final look at Winter's body. And I'll never forget my number seven come out and just stand next to me. Mm. And it literally, it makes me so emotional to think about because she just stands next to me and she's just looking at me, watching me as I'm greeting these people. And she just starts emulating what I'm doing. Mm. And, uh, in a way, it was like, it just was really beautiful to me just to look at my daughter and realize that she's watching me. And, you know, now I realize like just her, like she's just wanting to make everybody, she wants to make, wants it to be a party, you know? And so she wants to be there and she's watching me and we're doing this together. And I remember thinking about my other girls that had no desire to be anywhere near that, you know? And um, so I've had like really positive experiences, but even in that, that probably set this expectation that if I be this way, then they be this way and we can all be this way together and we can win, you know? And I th- it was a really beautiful moment I always carry, but also a moment where I realized I probably had an unrealistic expectation that my daughters just emulate me in every way, mm. which in some things I want them to, and I want them to learn from me, but in other ways I need to let them be them. You mm-hmm. know? So, mm. Yeah. I think the tendency in all parenting <clears throat> is the desire to make our children a facsimile of ourselves. Mm. And to the degree that we succeed at that, we feel we have succeeded as parents. Yeah. Right. Of course, the problem is if you're a, if you're a, a round, you know, block and your child is a triangle block right right mm-hmm. trying to fit them into that space on the board isn't going to work mm. and uh it's it's going to cause a, a lot of relational dissonance and yep. uh, hard hard feelings so right now you know as we're sitting here together you're exhibiting a lot of emotion which i never know if i'm going to have it or not but I, that moment caught me off guard that's grief yep. right i mean grief is a, a very surprising emotion yep. uh, when it decides to show up um, threes typically have the most problem recognizing their own feelings and the feelings of others like they don't they don't even they have trouble even naming feelings when they come up it's like i know i'm feeling something i just don't know what to call it mm-hmm. you know uh, and, you know, threes can, you know, kind of be, in, can be impatient with their own feelings because they're like, this is slowing me down and I have stuff to do. Yeah. It's something to work through. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As quickly and as efficiently as possible because I have things I got to get to do. Right. Yeah. The problem is that grief is really messy and, um, mm. you're on its timetable, right. not yours. Yeah. Right. So I just want to hear from you just a little bit about as a three, and I think this is instructive to all types. How have you, what was your journey of understanding the feeling? What has yeah. your relationship been like to the feeling of grief and loss? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll do a very three thing and talk about it in stages and timelines. Um, but honestly, you know, winter died in July, end of July. And I knew that I knew that I knew that the the thing that I had to do in the moment that she died at the hospital, my girls there, is just get them through that moment Mm -hmm. as best I could. And I wasn't going to fail at that. Like, I just knew that instinctively. And honestly, that's probably what I tried to do the first six months. Like, the the rest of 2018, I tried to do that. And it really wasn't until I settled in Franklin and life gets quiet and really boring. When you lose your spouse, you you realize how much time Mm. you devote to marriage when you don't have it anymore. And so I found myself with a lot of time, a lot of quiet time on weekends and evenings by myself. And um, I would say all of 2019 
was just devoted to grief. And the thing for me, I'm a, I'm a three with a two wing. Um, and professionally, I've always been like a number two in organizations, like an executive director or an executive pastor. I've been in these roles. And I've all, since I was a young guy, I knew that I was called to be a helper to somebody else. That's what I felt like. But when winter passed away, I feel like I kind of shifted and I went to like this three, and I can only see it now, but this three to with more of a four wing. So I found myself in such a place of solitude. And so I started going more internally. And I right away, like one of the things I wanted to do is make sure that people knew where I was, where my girls were, we had moved. And so I started po- writing and posting on social media um, a lot. And I would write pretty vulnerable things. I, I'm not, I'm a pretty vulnerable guy. I'm willing to share what's going on in my life. And so I started sharing and, and I went to, I wrote two books together, wrote a marriage book together, not a how to just to join us in the journey and then a parenting book. And so we had written a lot together. So I'd been the last four years just writing a lot. And this was the first thing I just started writing, um, just stories, like things that were happening in my life that were really amazing. And the way that I felt like God was meeting me and my sister coming to town and just the way that the church, church of the city, like received us and just welcomed us and the community, how they welcomed us. There were all these things that were happening that were beautiful. And so I began to write that out and I feel like I began processing my grief through writing and it would be in writing that I would realize what I'm actually feeling. Cause I'm having to explain something that I don't, I don't know that's co- what's going on inside, but I, but I feel it when I write, I still do. And so um, that was a gift to me, like being able to write and process some of that. And so for all of 2019, it was a massive, yeah, just massive season of grieving that I just, I think I settled into just being there and not having to get through it. Mm. And, uh, last year, last January, winter would have turned 40 and her 40th birthday that weekend was the most painful weekend besides her death that I walked through because I thought I would be done by then over it. And I'm, I found myself in this ho- hotel in Santa Barbara at this awesome event, this beautiful hotel room in Montecito. And it was the worst weekend of my life. Mm-hmm. And I just remember having to be there and just sit in it and stay there. And I had some amazing friends that supported me on that weekend. And I felt like on that weekend, the most amount of like grief, like if grief could be explained in leaving your body, like something that is leaving you, I feel like that weekend was like this, um, uh, this milestone moment for me. And from there on, like, it, it's obviously still there. Like, you just saw it in my face as I started crying telling that story. But from then on, uh, my 40th would have been, like, a couple months later, and that was a little bit lighter and different. And really COVID, the beginning of COVID in March, which was when my 40th birthday happened in 2020, um, that was, like, this marker of, like, everyone began <laughs> grieving a bunch of things, and I'm walking with grief, you know, my girls through the grief of all that that happened. And really, um, I would say up until May of that year, um, I was kind of, I feel like the grief was lifting. And then in May of 2020, I met um, someone that I'm in a committed relationship with ne- with now, and it's changed so much more of my grief. And I'm experiencing more joy than I've ever experienced since this process began. So it's another different stage. And one of the things I learned is with my girls with that is everything new that happens in life, you actually have to reprocess grief and walk through it again. And so it's just been an interesting season for me, like these last, I'd say, um, almost... Uh, 10 months now of walking through bringing somebody else into a relationship with us and what that does and how that impacts and affects. Mm. Anthony, what if I told you, you could get high quality, organic and non GMO groceries delivered to your door for a lot less than you're paying now and help out families in need. No, Mm -hmm. really? Let me tell you, that's what I'm doing since I discovered Thrive Market. As a proud Thrive Market member, I get the products I love and my paid membership provides a free membership for one low-income family. Oh, now I like this. Mm -hmm, Right? And let me tell you this. Okay. I've ordered off their website, which, by the way, is very user-friendly. It's not at all like, you know, like one of those websites where you feel like you just fell into some kind of terrible labyrinth. They have the best selection of high-quality, healthy, and sustainable products online. A couple of things I love. Mm Mm-hmm. They have Jackson's Honest Sweet Potato Chips. Have you ever jammed on those before? I have not. Well, you're welcome. All right. Mm -hmm. Jackson's Honest Sweet Potato Chips I got at Thrive Market. And I used to be a Goline cereal guy. Remember that? I know this, yes. Mm -hmm. And that's because I'm so healthy. But now I eat organic coconut flakes cereal from Thrive Market. Ooh, I can't wait to try that. It is changing my whole life as a special offer for Typology listeners. Join Thrive Market today to get 25% off your first order and an exclusive 
free gift. Mm. The only way to get this offer is by going to thrivemarket.com slash typology. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com forward slash T-Y-P-O-L-O-G-Y to get the exclusive offer of 25% off your first order and yes. a free gift. Nice. Mm-hmm. You can't get this offer anywhere else. Go to thrivemarket.com slash typology. So I want to ask Ian a question because I think you'd have a really good response to this. Can you talk about... Um, to the degree that you're willing to embrace grief, how it makes room for joy. I'm saying that in the light of him having said he's experiencing more joy now than he ever has. And he's been through a season of grief, which up until then he hadn't really experienced. So, yeah, I think that the best way I can explain it is maybe two ways. One is that grief carves out a place in you, um, that it, there's a, you know, a larger space, therefore, for joy to find its way mm. in in a new way, right? Yeah. Like in a way that you previously hadn't been able to experience. But but you had to move through a place where you allowed grief yeah. to carve out, you mm-hmm. know, it's it's excavate mm-hmm. a, a, a hole in you. And the hole, while it's still empty, is very painful. Mm-hmm. But when the joy comes, right, it... Uh, it has more real estate to occupy mm. than it did previously. Wow, well, that's good. You know, yeah. the other thing I'd say about grief is, and why why it's a, you know, you're never going to completely grieve this loss, mm-hmm. right? Um, I had a, a a friend of mine. It's interesting. Uh, they were a Rwandan couple, and every year, um, the guy celebrated uh, the anniversary of his wife's first marriage to her husband who was killed in the genocide Mm -hmm. as just a way of acknowledging Mm -hmm. he's gone right and but we we can't um you know decouple ourselves from those memories right and to celebrate his life without it being in any way diminishing of his presence in her life right um because i think with grief it's a little bit like walking around the david if you've been to italy and you've walked around the the statue of the david right Mm -hmm. Well, one stage in your life, you're looking at it from the front. And mm-hmm. then you revisit it the second you go there again, and now you notice something about the side. And as you get older, you just kind of do a, a – you walk around the whole experience. Mm-hmm. And from different vantage points, it looks different. It feels different. It is different. You recognize different elements of the loss mm-hmm. and of the joy that happened in its wake, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I think it just takes on different – it doesn't go away. It just takes on mm-hmm. different perspectives mm-hmm. as you as you move around it and – uh that's been my experience yeah. of, of grief. It, it's the loss changes. My relationship to it changes, but it doesn't go away necessarily. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've thought about that with even like, um, like thinking about my life as a book and I, I, I've actually explained it to my girls this way, even as I talked about moving forward and moving on in relationship and all that, like this idea of, you know, um, I would have loved for their mom and for winter, my wife to have been in our life for all of my chapters, like, and I always thought I would leave the book before she did, you know, and um, she left really early on, like, when we think about how long our life will likely be, um, but those chapters are always there, you can always go back to them and revisit them, and that's actually for me, like, like the moment I just had, I was revisiting her funeral, and it's like going back and reading a chapter in a book you hadn't read in a while, and you can go back to that place, and so anyway, it's, it's, to me, it's really beautiful, because there is, most of the time when I go back, there's nothing but gratitude that I have for that chapter, you know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you know, there's a quote by Anne Lamott I want to read you that I think has encapsulated a lot of what we, we've just said. She, she says this, you will lose someone you can't live without and your heart will be badly broken. Mm. And the bad news is that you never completely get over the loss of your beloved. But this is also the good news. They live forever in your broken heart that doesn't seal back up and you come through. It's like having a broken leg that never heals perfectly, that still hurts when the weather gets cold, but you learn to dance with the limp. Wow. That's beautiful. Yeah. And I wonder what moves me as I read that. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's that 
sometimes when I'm in the presence of a great truth expressed in fine language, it always kind of moves me. Mm-hmm. But I do think about my own um, experiences of grief and and realize that so much of my life has been about accepting the limp. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. you know. There's a great quote by um, Flannery O'Connor. She says, "I never trust a man without a limp." Wow. Mm-hmm. And I think that's again w- one of the gifts of grief of these experiences mm-hmm. is that it gives us a limp. Mm-hmm. But who can we trust? Can we trust anyone without one? Right. Well, you know, can we? I mean, you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, so I, I really appreciate. Anne's uh, take on on grief and understanding that it's uh, it's a it, it leaves a mark. It plays to that you know idea that it's always sadness mixed with gladness, grief mixed with joy, and being able to appreciate and hold the tension of that is is a large part of what life is all about. Mm. You know, did you get angry? You know, it's funny. I didn't get angry right away, and I couldn't even identify with the anger um, that some of my girls carried. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't get angry until I realized that others had expectations of who I was beyond that. So particular to dating or how long I should wait before I date or, you know, just decisions I would make. People always people that have invested in me have always had an opinion about what they think should be next. And obviously all of them well-meaning but what I would say that I realized I was angry in is I would say, I didn't ask for this. So, and, and also with my girls, sometimes if we had hard moments, I would say, I didn't ask for this. And those would be the words that would mark the most anger I had is saying, I didn't ask for this. Like, why am I dealing with this? And yeah, it's been more recent. It wasn't right away. I think, I don't know. I just, I guess I'm just an optimist. And I mean, I honestly believe what I believe in my faith and that I'll see my wife again. And so there are parts of me that have a hope that kind of go beyond the here and the now. And so I've leaned into that, but, um, but yeah, expectations that others put on me. And when I realized as a three and a people pleaser, how much, how much credit I give them in that at the expense of mm. what I want, um, that's been really painful. And mm. be, being willing to disagree or not take advice um, in that, it's been really, it's been really difficult for me because I feel like I'm letting people down that love me and care about me. And then I wonder, am I going to fail them? You know, Ian and I were talking about this earlier today. Maybe another word for that is power. How much power you're giving to other people Mm -hmm. as opposed to, you said credit, but yeah, Yeah. I've given lots of people, lots of power in my life. And honestly, I feel like the most healing I'm receiving as a three is being willing to let go of a lot of that. Mm. Because in my, in my mind, you know, the reason I feel like I'm like this, by the way, I grew up, my mom's German-American, as white as they come. My dad's African-American, brown guy. And I grew up in a world that was pretty white and rural. And um, I never felt like I fit in with my white family. I never felt like I fit in with my black family. My hair is different, doesn't look white, doesn't look black. Like, so I was always trying to fit in. And I just became a chameleon. And it served me really well in a lot of ways. And I'm actually really grateful for how God's wired me and how I'm made. But like, ultimately, it also made me so dependent on what other people think. And um, so it's been a hard thing to break, but I feel like these last, specifically this last year where I've been shedding that, knowing that I'm kind of moving into a new place, it's been the most difficult part of my life and also the most freeing in a way too, you know, so. That's beautiful. Hey, Anthony, you know my kids are grown, but you still have a couple at home, right? I still have a few at home. Well, let me tell you about this company who makes engaging products for kids of all ages ages. All right. KiwiCo creates super cool hands-on projects for kids of all ages designed to make learning about STEAM. That's an acronym, by the way, for science, technology, engineering, art, and math designed to make learning fun. Ooh, I love this. Each crate is designed by experts and tested by kids, offering fun opportunities to learn and explore at home. Mm. KiwiCo covers a wide range of subjects from science to art to geography, and each line caters to different age groups. Ooh, I like this. For instance, my assistant has two young boys, seven and nine, and they received a science crate, which included all the materials and learning resources to build a mechanical model of the sun, the earth, and moon, <laughs> and they designed their own constellations and made a light up 
Lantern. I love this. And they loved it. With KiwiCo's hands-on art and science projects, kids can engineer a walking robot, design a paint pendulum, conduct bubbling, chemistry, experiments, and more. This sounds like something you and I could have fun with. Totally. <laughs> and just for our Typology listeners, get 30% off your first month plus free shipping on any crate line with the code typology that's 30 percent off your first month at kiwico that's k-i-w-i-c-o dot com promo code typology t-y-p-o-l-o-g-y i admire the the story that you're telling and one of the things that I'm admiring as we're going here is um, how authentically you're speaking about about grief. So you have a, a new book mm -hmm. called My Winter Season. And uh, tell us a little bit about that book. Yeah, it's uh, it's called My Winter Season, Winter with a Y, because Winter's name was spelled with a Y. And um, the book is My Winter Season, Seeing God's Faithfulness to the Shadow of Grief. And it's just basically, it's kind of like a memoir, I guess I'd say, but I'm just telling stories it's mostly stories of people coming to my aid. There's a there's a, a verse in the Bible that says, "The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he love and uh, he he rescues them." And it, so it's just a book of like, just sharing about how I feel like I've been rescued and seeing that rescuing, like seeing how people have showed up for me, and also I think inspiration to want to be that myself. Like there's nothing that's motivated me to want to show up for people that are hurting than watching how people have showed up for me and my hurt. I'm just really, really grateful for that. And so it's a collection of stories about that. It's also a collection of, sto of stories um, about winter and just how she lived. And, you know, in 38 short years, she lived a lot of life. And I think for a lot of us, we, you know, we would say like she lived a short life, but in relation to like when you look at impact or you look at um, what she was able to accomplish, not only like just in career, but also with our girls and mainly with our girls, like I can wonder why she left so early but I cannot ignore the impact that she had on our daughters and the resilience they have. I mean, you know, as we were talking just before we got on here about resilience and I'm grateful that I feel like I have these four resilient daughters and I don't know where it came from, but I'm grateful for it. But I can tell you a lot of it came from their mom who was the daughter of a drug addict, grew up in inner city Baltimore in the 1980s drug infested community. She, would, she should not be what she mm -hmm. became. And somehow, some way, like this girl found that a way to... <laughs> you know, to make it in life and do, and do more than make it, but thrive. And um, so anyway, yeah. So we have a lot of listeners uh, and we're grateful for all of them. And I bet a significant number are grieving something, right? Mm -hmm. And they're consciously aware of it, right? So it's not just unconscious grieving, um, but they're, they're consciously aware of not just, as we mentioned earlier, the, the death of uh, someone they care deeply about, but some aspect of their life, loss in some aspect of their life. If they were here with us now and they were to ask you, how do I do this? What, what would you say? Yeah. So there's only one way to, for me to say this as a pastor, but I'll say it's a truism that's true regardless of what you believe. And, um, it's a scripture that says, whatever's true, whatever's right, whatever's honorable, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, whatever's excellent. If anything is praiseworthy, think about these things. And so I would simply say, like, just begin thinking about and living your life through a lens of looking for what you can find hope in and looking for what you can find joy in and looking for what you can find any crack of gratitude, because there's no doubt if you do, then you're going to be able to dwell on things that are going to impact your life for the better, as opposed to, and I'm not saying ignore the, look, like my first two months after losing winter were two of the darkest, no, they were the two darkest months of my life. I remember not being able to get out of bed. I remember sleeping a lot. I remember being afraid to have my closet door open. I remember thinking about Winter's body being in a morgue. I mean, all these different thoughts that go through your head. It was a dark time. But ultimately, the only way I feel like I've made it through and pulled through all that is thinking about things that are true and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and things that I can actually be thankful for. And so, I don't know. That's that's what I would say. Maybe that's being a, a real three. I don't know. <laughs> but no, I don't think so at all. I, mm -hmm. Actually, I was listening thinking that that isn't necessarily very much like a three. Oh, no? No. All right. It sounds to me like, again, a, like a little bit, uh, a three who's had their eyes opened. Yeah. Hmm. You know? And um, so that's a... Uh, how, how would you think a three would answer that question? I'm just curious. Oh, I mean, a three that's not very self-aware sure. or just sort of operating on autopilot? Well, I mean, I think that... Um, 
the answer might have been more task oriented. Hmm. Like, Do. like here's Elizabeth Kubler Ross's five stages of grief. You know what I mean? Like, well. uh, here's how you move toward acceptance. You know, well, you got to go through um, the, you know, the stage of n- denial, and then you, you know, you got to move toward bargaining and your our anger to bargaining mm-hmm. to, you, you yeah. know what I mean? And then you got to work your way. So it may be slightly more task oriented or action oriented because. Right. The first thing of three is thinking is action. Mm -hmm. What do I do? You know, it's funny. I did have those things like um, the the first thought I had, the thing I needed, and I feel like this was a right thing to do, was get my daughters through this. And that meant, like even in the the process of telling my girls their mom was gone, like how do I do that? How do I do that well? Um, That was the first. The second was uh, she had started this magazine for girls, and I said to myself literally, I will not let this die. I will not let her legacy die. And I didn't, I just, I just basically turned this for-profit into a non-profit and began doing all the things. And I remember being in a group, this little circle of pastors here in Nashville, didn't know any one of them. And they started asking my story. I'm telling them. And I, I found myself in tears and I said in this circle of pastors, I don't want to let my wife down. I don't want to fail her. And it was actually the, it was the most freeing moment I ever had. Cause even to admit that that's what I was, what was my motivation was, it was helpful for me to know that. Cause at the time I didn't think about it as being you know, about failure or about, you know, even, (laughs) even dealing with expectations that my wife that's no longer here on earth is even, you Mm. know, thinking about or caring about, you know? So, um, anyway, yeah, I've had those things. I was going to say the thing that didn't sound three about what you said was it was revealing, even though it was something you were doing, it was still very revealing. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, You know, when when I said that, right, here's what I didn't mean. That stage journey that Elizabeth Kubler Ross describes is very helpful. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's not perfect, but it's useful, right? What a three might not do, at, uh, who's not very self-aware, mm-hmm. is make clear how messy it is. Right, yes. That y- you're actually just not going to move through that thing uh, in clearly delineated ways and come out the other end done. It's like, no, it, you're going to go from, you know, denial to... Uh, let's say anger to yeah. bargaining back to anger, yeah. you know, fast mm-hmm. forward to this, to acceptance back away. So it's just a messy. Yes. It's so messy. And threes don't like messy, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, they would like it to be, okay, I'm going to do this. 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 I'm going to be done. And then I'm going to move on to something else. Yeah. Right. A three might say at some point, for example, as a one would, and we're going to later on walk through the different types and the, yes. the ways that they respond to grief. Uh, you know, I, I think they might at times be inclined like a one to say, why am I not done with this yet? Hmm. I, you know, it's like impatience. It's like, I should be over this by now. Mm-hmm. But a three would do it because it's like, because I have other things to, I, I have other things to move on to. Mm-hmm. And so part of it is like what you said, it's about being, not doing. It's recognizing mm-hmm. that, guess what? Um, you're actually not in control of the grief. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you, uh, one of the things I oftentimes say to people who want to rush grief mm-hmm. is just remember, man, let it have its way with you until mm-hmm. it's finished. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I mean, I had some real messes in my life. Um, you know, some of them I don't want to talk about, but I've had messes in my family and in relationships surrounding all that. And it, it really is messy. It's messy. It's messy going, cause my, my grief didn't look anything like there was no, acceptance, you know, all the things that you go through, the whatever stages, seven stages, whatever it is, like it didn't feel like that at all. I felt like I was all over the place all the time. And then there was also just relational dynamics. And, you know, my, I have a sister that moves to my house and she's to my daughter, she's like a new person. And to me, she's my sister. And so like wrestling through this new person mm-hmm. coming in, wrestling through me being in a new job that also came with its own um, demands and calls. And then wrestling through, um, my own desire for like just relationship and intimacy and finding myself just being like a single man that finally actually came to terms with like, I think I could do this the rest of my life. I think I can play golf like the rest of my life and not have any, (laughs) and I got over that. But, um, anyway, it has been messy and it's been beautiful at the same time. Like I look back and I don't like any of the mess I've walked through. I've only feel like I've learned from and, um, yeah, I've learned from it. So, Mm. you know, this, this quote I always identify with this old aphorism, which is you have to accept life on life's terms. Mm. 
you're not in control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Control is an illusion. Mm -hmm. Most people believe they have far more control over themselves and life than they actually do. Yeah. Right. And um, and part of that is just a, you know who does who wants to live with the anxiety of not being in control. It's much easier to come up with oh I'm in control right like, mm -hmm. but in reality, when a death hits, when an addiction hits, which is a, can be a big one, you realize I'm not in control. Yeah. And the moment you can do that. Uh, and realize that there is an intelligence in the universe that is in control, mm -hmm. then you can begin to exhale and go, okay, I'm going to be all right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Someone else, there is someone else far better than me has the wheel here. And the more I surrender to that, the better off I'm going to be, the happier I'm going to be. You know, it's funny that it just made me think of my, my daughter, uh, my oldest daughter, who's now 16, was 14 when this happened. Just a couple months into the grief, she's really smart and really um, has good word choices. But she said, this was just a, really early on. She said, Dad, you're like a, either an architect or a builder who uh, has built this house. And it's almost like somebody could come and just go and just blow it over. And I was just like, she just said this thing. like, wow. And it really... And I think that was in this moment of me just trying to make sure that everything was okay, everybody's okay, and just doing the three thing in the earliest stages. And it had a massive impact on me wow. um, in terms of like what I was doing versus what, you know, just the reality versus the what, what I was wanting to be, you know, mm -hmm, for us mm -hmm. and wanting us to, you know, yeah. look good, be good, be winning, all that, you know. Um, and I think because it was, I, I wanted to be in control and I, I felt like I had to be in control. If I wasn't in control, who was? Which is funny to say as a pastor, but yeah, it's probably where I was emotionally. You know, I, one of the things you're describing is just normal mm -hmm. and healthy, which is when death occurs, when some crisis hits, right? Uh, and you're a dad. I, I've had this happen with my own children in a couple of instances, two instances in particular where we had real crises. <clears throat> you know, in those moments, I'm like, I do not have time or the luxury to think feel yeah. <laughs> what is happening right, right. now because I got a lot of other people who need my attention right yeah right so I think that's just health I mean yeah. like it's like I would like to feel right now as a four you're damn right I would love to right. feel right now <laughs> um, and I got a lot of feelings about this but I have other people uh, particularly the one in crisis needs my full attention. Mm -hmm. My feelings are not the most important thing here. Mm -hmm. I really have to focus in and get these people through. So you have this postponed grief. Mm -hmm. And as long as you know that sometime or another, you got to circle back yeah. and deal with your feelings. Yeah. But right now, there's no, there ain't no sense of writing a poem when your house is burning down. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. Like you got to get a hose and put it out. So right. it's like, and, and maybe that's where a three could get themselves in trouble, which is they're very good at unplugging feelings and becoming very action oriented to the exclusion of feelings. Never coming back around. And then yeah. never coming back to them. Wow. Right. And then, but they're going to come back. Trust me, the soul is going to summon you at some point to dealing with those feelings, five years, 10 years, 15 years, right? It, so for the three to say, I will come back to this. Mm -hmm. I need to come yeah. back to this six months, a year later. You described that earlier in your experience. Uh, but for the moment, I think it's very normal for a healthy parent, spouse or whatever to say, yeah, my feelings are important, but right now for me to focus on them would be terrible narcissism. Yeah. I really need to, to go into action mode. Um, and I can remember with one of my children, we had a crisis and, um, what was hard was months later when I began to feel it, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it was almost like, um, you know, in, in the moment you have this trauma response, mm -hmm. which is like you just freeze up. It's like, and then when you go back, it's no longer fresh. Mm -hmm. The experience is no longer fresh. And so you're, you're, to get to the feelings is a little bit more difficult than it would have been at the moment, but I couldn't do it at the moment. Right. And I imagine if it's that difficult for a four – how much harder is it for a three to circle back around if they don't circle back around fast? Yeah, you know? well, I got a big three win, brother. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> gotcha. You know, I know, how to, I know how to do that for sure, for sure. Yeah. Man, this has been a rich, good conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I feel honored that it happened on Winter's birthday. 
And I'm really excited uh, about this book, The Winter Season. Uh, is there? Is it? Does it have a subtitle? What's the subtitle? Yeah, my winter season: seeing God's faithfulness in the shadow of grief. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm glad it fell on her birthday too. I feel like I'm always getting like these winks from her of like, "You're good. You'll be all right." So it's, I don't know. It's been fun. So mm. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. Well, Jonathan Pitts, author of the Winter Season. When does it release? Yeah, so it released on February 9th. So it's fresh off the press. The ink is wet. <laughs> fresh off the press, yeah. <laughs> nice. And now you're learning that the only thing harder than writing a book is promoting a book. Right. <laughs> I'm exhausted already. So. <laughs> There's so much to do, man. Yeah, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's honestly like the honor of my life to be able to share it, though. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a season. I had a my winter season. Now I've got this promotional season, so we'll get after it. Yeah, well, best wishes to you, man. Yeah. We wish you all the best, and everything that you're doing thank you 